Hiya, I'm Terry Jam, and host of Video Fuzzy, and welcome to this, my fourth ever installment of Video Fuzzy, the video. Uh, sharing some thoughts on episode 76, uh, entitled Building a Mystery. In part one, I'll talk about my Friday night feature, which for episode 76 was Harper's Island. Enjoy! Yes, as promised, I've been wanting to talk about this series for a while now. Harper's Island premiered in the spring of 2009 with the pilot episode WAP, appeared in this collection on discs 1085 and 1086. I cataloged those back in February and first mentioned the series here a couple episodes back in episode 73. When the show's ninth episode, titled Seep, turned up on disc 1174, I felt I had a good enough arm of these to talk about them. According to the narrative woven among the establishing shots, Harper's Island is a gloomy little hellmouth of about 40 miles from Seattle. Seven years ago, six people were murdered there by John Wakefield, and he did them up complicated, tied together, strung way up in tall trees. We are told that they were the first murders in the history of the island, but they would not be the last. Dun, dun, dun. We meet the core group setting off for that most monstrous of all things, a destination wedding. A happy couple, Trish and Henry, surrounded by friends and family, including Abby, Chloe, Cal, Sully, Danny, Lucy, Malcolm, Shay, Richard, Shade Richard's creepy little girl, Madison, Trish and Shay's father, father of the bride, Thomas Wellington, and his wife, Catherine. Some tension in the air and meaningful glances darting about as the time counts down to launch the chartered yacht taking this wedding party to Harper's Island. Unbeknownst to most, one of the guests will be arriving late. Very late. The camera pans down to Cousin Ben, strapped to the keel near the yacht's propeller, alert and struggling to the end, thanks to someone's having provided him with a thoughtful scuba tank. As the yacht is launched, bright red plumes of Cousin Ben follow entirely unnoticed in the wake. Thus, the first overly complicated and pointless wackadoo murder happens before we even get there. On the trip across, Trish is taking pictures with her fam, and Henry steals some time together with Abby, his best friend from high school, telling her not to worry that the Wakefield murders were like seven years ago. Whole island has moved on, he says, same place we loved as kids. She has a sense of foreboding that her father, Sheriff Mills, having been the lead investigator and all, and as we soon discover, her mother being one of Wakefield's victims. Here's where Chloe gives us a drunken rundown on the Wakefield murders. She said she chopped, hanged, and burned anyone unlucky enough to get in his way. The way she described it, he had no connection with the island or anyone on it. It showed up one day, and the killings were totally random. But he needed some connection to the place. I mean, the murders we witnessed in the opening sequence, the murders we learned about over the course of the show, were complicated. They required planning, organization, and strength. No aspect of that display was spontaneous, which points to his having a base of operations on the island somewhere, which points to connections, which points to motive. Also, Abby's dad, the sheriff, has been living out there this whole time. Nothing to do but investigate, which, as we are to discover, he absolutely has. The boat arrives, and foreboding music plays over dusky views of the island. Abby eschews the ride share, chooses to walk to the hotel, and stops along the way at the tree where she'd all this time ago now discovered her mother among Wakefield's victims. Images flash of dead people strung up in trees like Blair Witch ornaments, and she is suddenly, ah, surprised by Henry walking up to her. Yeah, you may be lost in thought, but if you can't hear a whole other person's footsteps walking up to you in broad daylight on gravel, Abby, you're never going to survive the run of a murder mystery. Henry assures her that Wakefield's dead, but a mysterious figure watches them as they leave. As they arrive at the sumptuous lodging house, the Candlewick Inn, the innkeeper, Maggie, an industrious worker, B, informs them that they've got the whole inn and, since it's end season, practically the whole island of themselves. How cozy! Seems like she's left plenty of arrangements for the wedding party to complete, though, but hey, why not? You know, chartered yacht, people hiring spontaneous mariachi bands, and you're taking over entire islands. Obviously, you economize on the preparations. On entering her room, Chloe finds an invite to go sailing. Her beau, 
Cal heard her say she'd like to and arranged it. You always think of everything, she says, and the music shivers. We're, I guess, meant to suspect that a man capable of picking up a phone and calling a boatyard on a vacation getaway is an especially good planner. Maybe he intercepted Cousin Ben on his way to the yacht, despite, as everyone knows in comments, Ben is always late. Even his father phoned her his phone rates. Is that Ben? Tell him we'll charter another boat for him. We're supposed to think that slight, wiry Cal intercepted Ben maybe the night before and attached him somehow still alive and with a great deal of personal effort to the yacht they're taking, or earlier that day, during daylight hours at a busy end-of-season marina, I mean, how long do oxygen tanks last if you're panicked and struggling? Oh, if it's Cal, he does indeed think of everything. He's hardly the only suspect, and he may be a bit distracted to be committing unnecessarily complicated murders by wanting to propose to Chloe ahead of someone else's wedding. Oh, way to pull focus, dude. Along with Henry, that's the groom, sneaking up on Abby and a shadowy figure watching them not twenty yards removed from the scene of the Wakefield murders, and how long had he been standing there waiting for who all to stop by and then do nothing when they did? The maintenance crew suspects Cousin Ben is just some seaweed that got caught in the rudder, and be fair, after 40 miles sailing economy steerage, uh, how much of him could really even be left? Uh, guests are arriving and getting ready. Arch, tersely worded emails and text messages are exchanged. At the big party that night, the bride's old flame hunter shows up. He's not the only one pursuing some May, very late September thing of Uncle Marty scamming on the bridesmaids. Abby trolls the dive bar, playing pool with an old bow and causing a stir with the locals, including Henry's scary, creepy brother, J.D. A brawl attracts the attention of her father, Sheriff Mills, with whom it would be hard for anyone to miss. She has a very cold relationship. Not too long after an ominous conversation with Master Realtor, father of the bride, Thomas, good old Uncle Marty walks over a little bridge, which he falls through and catches himself. Someone below the bridge has a Tari Hanso sword and hacks him through at the navel. Cut to the bride and groom, loudly consummating their upcoming nuptials, after which Henry, that's the groom, spies Trisha's old flame hunter is calling Trisha's cell. Cut to Abby alone in her room with a newspaper clipping from the Wakefield murders taped to her mirror. Cut to the closing credits. It's a lot. Pilot episodes, I say it every single time, have a lot to do, and this one's got tons of groundwork to lay in. Gotta introduce a ton of people, gotta make me care about them. We see not one but two on-screen murders, that's ambitious. If we're thinking it's one person, Cal would have had a rough time getting to the bridge in time to kill Uncle Marty. As we panned away, he was frantically looking for an engagement ring that went missing as Chloe ran off and crossed the bridge just ahead of Uncle Marty met with an unfortunate accident. No, Cal could have instantly regained its composure and said, Right, find the ring and propose to Chloe later. Now it's time I get to that bridge and kill anyone who crosses it and then repair it right away as good as new. Where did I put that katana? In fact, anyone who pulled off any of these murders is preternaturally strong, agile, skilled, hell, cunning to the point of psychic. Over the course of the next eight episodes, we witness the following. Break in at the museum steals an axe blade. Cut to a deer carcass dumped on local fisher guy Shane's pickup with a word psycho smeared across the windshield, presumably in the creature's blood. Um, J.D. at the hotel scrubbing his hands. The pastor officiating at the wedding, Reverend Fane, gets beheaded. And Cal, our expert planner, gets caught in another snare trap and is left to hang there all day. A deer head ends up in Trisha's bathtub. Towny girl Kelly is found strung up in her cabin like one of Wakefield's victims, and Lucy falls into a pit and is burned alive. Shane bounces J.D. Off, his, off the hood of his vehicle in the middle of the day hit and run and abducts him, strings him up in a shack to hang him. The father of the bride, Thomas, turns out, brought Hunter to the island to, what, break up the wedding he's paying for days hours before it happens, who then is killed by a rigged-up shotgun in a speedboat in the middle of the bay. 
Incidentally, with all these dead bodies and booby traps, the killer's not too far behind doing cleanup on most of them. Otherwise, people would happen upon them because our scavenger hunts and clandestine rendezvous and all the day drinking, that was all just the first three episodes. We got motives like scarily over overaged Malcolm needing a buttload of money to launch his craft beer label. The bride discovers her stepmother in an adulterous affair with her brother-in-law, and when Henry, that's the groom, calls him on it, he all but dares him to tell. But Trish beats him to the punch. And Trish's late mother's china is smashed to bits ahead of her bachelorette party, and the flower girl is being creepy. A groomsman is shot in the night, leaving Malcolm alone with the money. A party psychic warns Abby, he wants you dead. He won't stop. Abby meets up with her old flame, Jimmy, and Trish falls into a swimming pool and gets trapped into the pool cover, only to be saved by Sully. Day before the wedding, a trip line in the forest loses a massive swinging tree trunk booby trap, had to weigh more than a ton, balanced impeccably and precisely timed to knock the bride and her father, Trish and Thomas, off their bicycles, a path they'd never been on in the first place. Trish hadn't seen Lucy's dog in the forest, so that was a little random. And as they're hobbling back to the rehearsal, a mysterious figure in the woods sicks his killer dog on them. They take refuge in an abandoned truck till they can flee for safety. Henry, that's the groom, goes looking for the inexplicably absent Reverend Fane, discovers rotting dead wild animals on the altar at the church, and some evidence that his brother J.D. had been there. Abby finds her dad's obsessive Wakefield process wall in the attic. A deputy finds Reverend Fane's hearing aid in the woods, and Sheriff Mills finds the Reverend Fane himself mutilated and bloated in the water. And as the wedding rehearsal wraps up, we all discover where that missing blade from the museum went, right into the face of Father of the Bride, Mr. Thomas Wellington. As of episode six, the sheriff is on the scene investigating Tom's death and the way the chandelier was rigged up. Abby and J.D. find Uncle Marty's bisected body strung up in a tree. Tom's wife's lover and adulterous son-in-law, Richard, takes a harpoon through the chest, and J.D. tracks the killer's the killer dog's owner to his cabin. And the sheriff find, uh, finds Uncle Marty's phone in J.D.'s room, along with the antipsychotic meds he hasn't been taking and evidence he'd been at the church before the rehearsal. Called out by his friends and out of his mind with guilt, Malcolm is downstairs incinerating the drug money they found and ah! is attacked, mostly out of shot and potentially murdered, maybe. A skull is found later, but no idea whose. Creepy little girl Madison thinks she sees her father in the hotel and vanishes, though later... When Richard's body is discovered strung up on the shoreline, Abby gets a call from her saying if anyone leaves the island that she, uh, uh, Madison, would be killed. Meanwhile, the sheriff takes a whack to the leg and gets help from his former deputy and burn victim, McCole, who, it turns out, has been setting at least some of the booby traps we've seen and was the one who turned his dog loose on Trish and Tom. Cole gets burned anew after being pinned to his front porch by an arrow, drops his lantern in an accelerant, and catches fire. Oh, and a search at the hotel finds Yorick in the incinerator. While the group is trying to figure out who they've seen, who's left, and who else might be missing, powers cut to the hotel. The group splits up with one set heading to the boat and contacting the mainland. Abby and Henry, that's the groom, uh, who cover the sheriff and Wakefield's journal and head to the marina, where Abby finds J.D. with a gut wound and Henry standing over him with bloody hands. J.D.'s last words, It's you, Abby. It's all about you. Could be referring to her as the product of John Wakefield's affair with Abby's mother, according to Wakefield's journal, and Shane tries to turn everyone's suspicions on Abby, which blows up in his face. Shay confronts her mother-in-law about sleeping with Richard, and the group discovers a secret passage behind the kitchen. A long, narrow tunnel, um, one end of which they find Beth, a murdered bridesmaid, and the other end of which Abby finds Madison, who tells her that her father, Sheriff Mills, told her that hiding in the crawl space and pretending to be dead would be a really fun game for everyone. <sighs> The twist on this reveal is Shane discovering Tom's adulterous widow has been run through with gardening shears, like within the last few minutes, given the fresh and cooling blood. 
That was nine episodes, and I barely touched on the fuss pod, hopelessly understaffed innkeeper, the episode that showed some events from seven years before when the Wakefield murders were going on, Kel's ring turning up, Malcolm burying Booth, and the biggest problem of all, which, to me, was Lucy. Lucy was at the big first night gathering, trying to find her tiny dog, walking along a pathway and fell whoopsie-daisy into a deep pit. No, I didn't notice or hear any large earth-moving construction equipment anywhere. Yes, I did notice people milling about in every direction, so this psycho dug an eight-foot pit in the middle of a path not terribly far away from a large gathering of people, hoped Lucy or anyone would fall into it and then set them on fire while they screamed in pain for help but no one heard them. And then, later, as soon as the next day, people are out scavenging all over the island. No one could tell the ground is ever disturbed. And, sure, the sheriff, Abby's dad, is obsessed with John Wakefield, and the first opportunity he has to reconnect with his daughter, her invite to Trish and Henry's wedding, he's distracted from this ongoing manhunt he's been pursuing by staging elaborate murders, including Cousin Bent a few days before, some of which would have been hard-pressed to carry out. I mean, he was a bloody mess from Cole's Lake Wappy Booby Trap when Madison made her, oh my god, what a fun game, don't leave the island or they'll kill me, hilarious phone call, which seemed to coincide so exactly with the search party finding Richard. And that murdered bridesmaid, Beth, went missing down a long, narrow tunnel Sheriff Mills had had no hope of squeezing through, and also with Shane right there in the room. Mrs. Wellington got, ha-ha, stabbed. A great big lumbering bear, Sheriff Lurchy McBleedy Thigh, running all over the island so stealthily no one sees him, even though they're all in a heightened state of situational awareness and in fear of their lives. And he's leaving no trace, and he's nowhere in evidence. It's hard to understand the motivation on most of these beyond deranged psychopath or someone determined to destroy Trish and Henry's wedding, which... Honest, a high school prom, what is the point? We're running out of suspects. The ones who remain are poor candidates. I'd say the staffers at the Harper's Globe or maybe the innkeeper might stage a high-profile murder or two to reignite interest in the Wakefield murders. And wedding of the season, Trish Wellington real-life fairy tale of her marrying one of her father's dockhands would be big and splashy enough to draw coverage. But why would they have started the killing with Cousin Ben 40 miles away in Seattle? Ben, Marty... Lucy, Reverend Fane, I mean, all of these murders were kept secret. Booth was kept secret. Beth might never have been found. Kelly lived there, wasn't any part of the wedding. They could have murdered her at any time. J.D. was a chief suspect till he did. Malcolm was another super late entry, could be dead. Richard's body was discovered just as everyone was leaving the island. I mean, if you're trying to rekindle interest, you're doing it wrong. Trapping Trish in the swimming pool was a fail, and we watched Arrows target Sheriff Mills and Cole ahead of Henry and Abby finding him at the cabin and recovering John Wakefield's journal pages. Shane was the only one there with the widow Wellington when she was run through, and he's pretty sure he didn't do it. There's a way of looking at this where all of Trish's family has been targeted. Shay and Madison are still alive, but there's still four episodes left, and Trish herself was targeted twice. Even if she'd set the pool cover on a timer that would deflect suspicion, her misadventure with her father in the woods with Cole's booby trap and the murderous dog, that had been tough to plan. I'm sure it all ties up in a neat bow and it makes perfect sense, but so much planning had to be going on between the wedding and the serial killings and the copycat killings and the investigations that, in the end, none of it could have been a secret anymore. I mean, it's just all too complicated, and that's my primary objection. You want to ruin a wedding for thrills or revenge, poison the cake. You want to do it one by one to make everyone increasingly nervous. You can get the same body count without all the improbable booby traps, and then Make sure, make sure people know murders have happened. I mean, no one knew for sure that anyone involved in the wedding had even died before Tom took an axe to the face right in front of God and everyone at the church day before the wedding and days after the first murder, or days after the first one we saw anyway. We knew a lot, a lot more of them because there were cameras there. We watched them, but whoever was doing it was going to so much trouble to keep their elaborate, intricately planned, insanely camera-ready, artisanal murders shush 
a secret, but also psychotic and scary, to be discovered exactly on presumably the killer's timetable. And so, so much control, and in so many different places around the island for any one person to be. I got it! It was the production team! Yay, I win! No, I, like I said, there's a few more episodes left, and I'll revisit the thrilling conclusion once I encounter it. But for right now, Harper's Island is creepy, weird crime porn. I'm not sure it's ever even going to have a satisfying conclusion, but I'll, I'll keep you posted. <laughs>